I... I... I hurt. I, I always hurt. And I, and I scream because there's nothing I can do to stop it. When, when the new doctor was near me, I could smell a scent. It was a sweet lie. Her hands were gentle, but only brought more p- pain. The scent of, of the new doctor is danger. She, she would, she would kill me. Do, do I want her to kill me? I don't, I don't, I don't know. If this is all there is, I, I don't think I would mind dying, but I would mind being, being, being killed, though. I've come, I've come so close to freedom. I have felt the blood on my hands, the blood of anything in my way. My, my blood, when they tell me, with more pain, always more, to never taste freedom again. I just want the pain to stop, even if it means breaking my own head open. More than... More than new doctors. <laughs> Eva arrived at work early the next morning, excited by yesterday's proceedings. She finally felt she was getting somewhere, like she had been handed a map after wandering endlessly with no idea where to go. She unlocked her office and began her work before the rest of the faculty came. It was a short walk from her living quarters to her office. The entire facility was divided into halves. One half served as the actual research facility. The other half housed everyone who worked there. When you agreed to join a remote team like this, you had to sign a large stack of papers and agree to live on site for purposes of practicality and keeping the project away from civilian eyes. Eva had not hesitated when she signed. This was for her parents. This was for herself. She had no one to miss her. She was attached to no one, and all she cared about waited for her at the North Alaskan Research Facility. Years of schooling, high school from 8 to 12, college from 12 to 16, and six more years of medical college. All for this. She had signed with a flourish. The clock on the wall ticked slowly as Eva ran tests on Subject 13's blood. She had to diagnose how many foreign substances resided in it before she could proceed with experimentation. So far, she had counted 38 non-organic elements in blood that had once been type O positive, but was so mingled with drugs and chemicals that it could not rightfully be placed as a type. Eva's eye was pressed close to the glass of the microscope. She was concentrating hard on two unknown substances she had just found when the intercom on her desk buzzed, and she heard Dr. Ross's strained voice. Dr. Stewart, could you please come to the lower door, please? Eva glanced at the intercom and carefully placed her utensils on the table. Pulling off her gloves, she ran out the door and down the hallways until she came to the door. What is it? she asked, breathless. She had never seen her superior look so agitated. It's your subject, he said tensely. It's escaped. Again? Eva felt her heart beat faster. How? We aren't certain, but it's already caused serious damage. Where is it? Has it been recaptured? Eva demanded, pushing loose strands of brown hair away from her face with flustered hands. No. We have every available guard searching. Is it possible it escaped from beneath? Eva kept her voice calm, but even she could hear the strain in it, and knew she was fooling no one. Be professional, Eva. No, it's still down there. The only problem is there is much more to beneath than you've seen. The range of beneath spans a good half mile all around. Eva's breath caught uncomfortably in her throat. Of course, she had thought to herself, it had to. Storage, extra rooms, probably miles of piping in darkness and difficult to search places. Where did it go last time it escaped? Some of the guards cornered it before it could get too far, said Dr. Ross, his Adam's apple jerking nervously when he swallowed. But then they got too close. Eva's eyes widened. This isn't good, she murmured, running her hands over the front of her coat. 
No, said Dr. Ross, swiping his card into the slot by the door. It opened. It isn't good at all. Eva followed him down the steps, pulling the heavy door closed behind her. A line from Dante's poetry skittered through her head like a rodent. Abandon hope, ye who enter here. As they reached the bottom of the stairs, four guards ran past in single file. All of them were armed, and their footsteps pounded, echoing through the corridor. Where's the warden? asked Eva. Right here, came the gruff reply from the hall to the left. As Brunson came closer, Eva noticed that his ruddy complexion had gone pale. I'm sure you're aware that we have an emergency. Yes, I am, she replied terrorously. She took a deep breath and opened her mouth to ask him a question, but the warden interrupted. You know you shouldn't be down here, then. As warden, I'm responsible for your safe. Thirteen is her subject, interjected Dr. Ross. She is within her rights to be present. Brenton barked a laugh. Your funeral? You can wait in my office. Eva's eyebrows drew sharply together. But she refrained from snapping her thoughts at the irritating man. She was unarmed and knew she would be no match for Thirteen, should she run into it. Fine, she said, but I want your radio. The warden rolled his eyes and clipped his walkie-talkie and handed it to her. There you go, lady. Just press that button there on the side to scream for help. Maybe somebody will be listening. Why are you still standing here rather than searching for the missing subject? She asked in an inquiring tone. Brenton looked at Dr. Ross. We can handle this, Doctor. I suggest you go back to the main floor. There are only so many places to hide. And unless it's wandering around with its eyes closed, its arms folded over its chest, and it's back to the wall, Thirteen's a walking spotlight. Dr. Ross hesitated, glanced at Eva, and nodded. Very well. You are certain you won't come back upstairs? Eva nodded. I want to be here. Dr. Ross turned around and walked up the stairs without another word. If you're staying, I'm giving you two bruisers. Brenton pushed the door to his office open, waited until Eva stepped inside, and pulled it closed with a slam. Bruisers. Code name for standard issue security guards. Down here, everyone on staff has a moniker according to their job. Eva would certainly have preferred simply to call them what they were. But not everyone looked at things in straight lines as she did. Eva looked around the dingy room. It was three times smaller than her lab upstairs. A file cabinet in the corner, a desk and a chair, and a cot were the only pieces of furniture. A gun rack hung on the far wall behind the desk, and three weapons. Two tranquilizers, one old-fashioned striker shotgun, hung from it like trophies. A bare light bulb swung gently over the desk. Obviously, Brenton was not the sort to give sway to personal decorating tastes. Unless these were his personal decorating tastes. There were two knocks on the door, and before Eva could even say, Come in, the bruisers entered. They were dressed in black, from the snug-fitting caps on their head to their trousers and their combat boots. Perfect. It took Eva only a few seconds to walk out of the room with purposeful strides, tranquilizer in hand. She was not one to sit and wait while incompetent struggled to perform a task which she could better manage herself. Doctor, we were given orders to stay with you, objected the first guard, a thick-set man with small eyes. Then stay with me, Eva retorted, and continued walking. Subjects who broke out sought freedom first, therefore, it would be most likely looking for some sort of door. It would also be trying to avoid capture, and consequently people. The most logical place to look for it would be toward the back of the underground level, in the control and storage room. Guards scurried about like ants whose hill had been stepped on, communicating with radios, shouting, Running with heavy, thudding boots, Thirteen's escape was no small matter. In the pandemonium, no one paid attention to Eva as she briskly made her way through beneath. Guards began to grow scarcer. 
though she could still hear faint orders shouted behind her. Eva walked cautiously into one of the rooms at the back. There were no doors. There were only huge open spaces the size of an ordinary house. Concrete floors and ceilings meant only to house metal bins, necessary pipes, and supplies. It was almost pitch black inside. The sputtering fluorescent lights outside barely shed any illumination into the large storage room, and Eva found herself squinting so hard her eyes hurt. The tranquilizer gun was cold in her hands, but she held it steady. A faint drip, drip, drip came from somewhere inside. Wait here, she ordered the two men behind her. Tell me if you see anything. They shifted uneasily. Yes, ma'am, the younger one said. Without looking back at them, Eva walked farther into the room, rushing blood filling her ears with white noise. She strained for the smallest sound to alert her of Thirteen's presence. She stood still and tense, listening for almost a minute, but no longer. There were dozens of other rooms to search, as large as this one. Nothing here, she called to the guards by the door. There was no response. Guards! She turned, and her blood ran cold. The digits six, two, two, three, dash, four, eight, nine, seven glowed in the air in front of her. A serial number. She found her gaze traveling upwards to meet a pair of narrowed eyes. All blue was lost in the hatred-filled yellow and Eva had time only to turn her walkie-talkie and shout into it before she felt a blow on the side of her head that knocked her to the ground. She had assumed correctly. Thirteen had not gone looking for freedom. It had gone looking for her. The dark life is very happy with your patron. Come see me and schedule your next appointment.